Welcome to Living the Smarter Science of Slim, where we provide a scientifically proven lifestyle for long-term health and fat loss by eating more and exercising less, but smarter. Eat smarter, exercise smarter, live better. I am so ready for that. Hey everyone, Jonathan Baylor, Carrie Brown here, Living the Smarter Science of Slim. Going to talk about the third factor that determines the quality of a calorie today, or the N insane nutrition. You know, I studied nutrition at school. That would be about 100 years ago. <laughs> I <laughs> okay. thought I'd get that in before you did. Um, and, um, and since I met you, I've discovered that everything they taught me was pretty much wrong. <laughs> well, it, it's like most of the things we talk about, Carrie, where there's a bit of truth there, but the challenge is everything we've heard about nutrition has to do with nutrition quantity rather than nutrition quality. And when we pivot nutrition on a quality basis rather than a quantity basis, it does flip quite a few things on their head. Yep. So the key distinction here, like I already said, is the difference between nutrition quantity and nutrition quality. And intuitively, we all kind of know this. For example, if I were to say that 10 donuts are 10 times as nutritious as one donut, of course, that's bananas. That doesn't make any sense because we all know intuitively that along with 10 donuts because comes 10 times more of the things that are not great about donuts, and that's why they're not 10 times more nutritious. We have to look at the ratio of bad stuff to good stuff, not just the raw quantity of good stuff, which is what nutrition typically does, right? You look on the side of a sweetened cereal box, and you see the quantity of nutrition, but we don't talk about is the quality of calories we're getting along with that nutrition, and that gives us a pretty inaccurate picture of nutrition. So it's not necessarily better to eat, you know, 10 times as much cereal because it's been fortified with vitamin B12. Exactly. Well, and the whole concept, Carrie, of fortification is, a, is actually wonderful for what we're talking about. It's saying, here's a food which is not nutritious, and we're going to try to infuse it with nutrition. But everything that still makes that food not nutritious is there. It's, it's like taking a vitamin C pill and dissolving it in Pepsi. Like it doesn't make the Pepsi healthy now because it contains vitamin C. Everything that makes white bread bad for you is still in whole wheat bread. It's just that there's also some other things. So, but we seem to have lost sight of that. We think we can just add nutrition into foods and that's all that matters and, and sadly it's not. Hmm, I've never thought about it like that, but now I have, on that rare occasion that I eat bread, I'm just going to eat white bread and be done with it now. <laughs> well, I hope you're kidding, but <laughs> on the, yes, well, I guess on the rare occasion, it's not, about being, it's not about being perfect, but when we start to think about just the sheer quantity of nutrition and things, again, we can end up with a really weird state of affairs where you have, you know, sugar, smack, puff, charms, just so I don't get sued by anyone. <laughs> And, you know, it's a great source of whole grains and it provides 100% of your vitamin A, B, C, and D. If I take a five pound bag of sugar and drink it and then take a vitamin pill, it, it doesn't make what I just did healthy, even though right. I just got 100% of all of my daily vitamins and minerals because of all the other things I took in with that nutrition makes it uh, not nutritious at all. Right. And this is the very roundabout way of, <laughs> of getting to this very simple equation, which is... When we look at nutrition labels and when we say things like 10 donuts are not 10 times more healthy than one donut, we have to think about nutrients per calorie rather than just total number of nutrients. Okay, got it. And when we talk about nutrients per calorie, that's really more of a quality measure there, and that really does flip things on its head. For example, if we were to look at just, uh, let's say, a cup of enriched wheat flour versus a cup of spinach, and I'll put this, uh, we actually have a nice graph here I'll put up on the website. The enriched wheat flour actually looks like it has quite a bit more nutrition than the spinach, and it's a cup compared against a cup, so from a quantity perspective, man, that wheat flour looks like a pretty good option relative to that spinach, doesn't it, Carrie? And looking at that chart, yes, it does. But here's the challenge, Carrie, that that cup of enriched wheat flour contains 495 calories. And guess how many calories the cup of spinach contains? Three. Well, almost seven. 
So, so, but here, here's the problem with that quantity comparison, right? We were taking 495 calories worth of enriched wheat flour and comparing it with seven calories of spinach. That's not a fair comparison. If we compare 250 calories of enriched wheat flour versus 250 calories of spinach, looking at nutrition per calorie, what we see here and what you can see if you visit the show notes is that spinach just crushes in enriched wheat flour. I'm talking like spinach has 2,000% more vitamin A and 500% more vitamin C and 6,000 plus percent more vitamin K. It's, it's just no comparison. Yeah, yeah, looking at that chart, that is kind of crazy. <laughs> good crazy. It, it is good crazy, but think about it, Carrie. That is how when people talk about nutrition, they often say, well, these whole grains are a, a good source of X. But what, what's missing from that, again, that's nutrition quantity. Yes, that 400 calorie serving of pasta does have some riboflavin in it. But what else could we have done with those 400 calories? Like if we had 400 calories of organic grass-fed beef and kale, we'd have a heck of a lot more riboflavin, a heck of a lot more of everything because we have to look at nutrition per calorie, not just raw quantity of nutrition. Got it. That's a whole new way of looking at things, though. It, it is a whole new way of looking at it, and it's the good news, a couple of good things. First, it's, it's pretty easy to do. We just look at, we don't just look at the percent of nutrition or the percent of vitamin C. We look at the percent of vitamin C on the nutrition label, then we look at the number of calories, and we just do a quick comparison. So you're, you're using this as, as part of how to tell how sane a food is. Is that right? I am, I am, and actually, forget about the equation I just mentioned. Don't don't forget about it, but don't feel like you need to use it because most people don't like doing math and we can provide some more general guidelines that will help you make the most nutritious decisions possible here in a few minutes. Okay. But circling back, the really key reason it's important to look at nutrition this way, and when I say this way, I'm saying nutrition per calorie is two things. One, it gives us a more accurate view of which foods are nutritious. We just did an example of this, of wheat flour versus spinach. It also helps us to understand how we can get our body to burn fat instead of suffering from the side effects of starvation that we covered in earlier podcasts, such as slowing down our metabolism or burning muscle. Got it. And those are very important, right? Knowing which foods are nutritious and not slowing down our metabolism and burning muscle, but instead burning fat, well, that's what we're all here to do. So this really is a key key thing for us to understand. So those ads where, and I don't have TV, so it's been a long time since I've seen one, but I remember there being some ads which which kind of had, you know, if you eat a bowl of this cereal, then it's like eating, you know, 58 bowls of broccoli or something like that. They're actually really misleading. They are very misleading. And you could create a similar commercial that says taking this vitamin pill is like eating uh, I don't, some truckload of, of food. Uh, but we all know that just eating a vitamin pill is not the same. We all know intuitively that's not the same. And years and years of research have basically shown that despite how much we think we understand about nutrition, the more we learn, the more we find out we don't understand. And pretty much everyone in the exercise health fitness community, there's, of course, people disagree on a lot of things. But one thing that pretty much everyone agrees on, even you know people... The, the vegans versus the carnivores, everyone pretty much agrees that eating food is critical and that this idea that we can just extract out nutrients and take pills and that that somehow can do all of the things food can, uh, pretty much anyone who, who's in this arena and, and knows what they're talking about realizes that human ingenuity, no matter how smart we think we are, uh, we, we're not going to outsmart millions of years of evolution that got us here. So back to nutrition quality. We talked about it's about nutrients divided by calories, but we can simplify this carry. And we talked in earlier podcasts about the first two factors of calorie quality being satiety and aggression and how foods high in water, fiber, and protein are very satisfying and they're unaggressive. And that's great because we're just like water, fiber, protein. That's all we need to think about. Good news, carry that holds for nutrition as well. Foods that have the highest ratio of nutrients to calories are high in water, fiber, and protein. So everything that we're already doing, all of the foods that we've already identified as sane, same things apply. Water, fiber, protein makes them high in nutrition. That's pretty handy. 
It's very handy, and here's why. Because it, well, it keeps it simple, right? Very simple, very simple. Don't need I'm, to. I'm not juggling with well. This list of food is is good for these reasons, and this list is good for those reasons, and I, it's all the same list. All the same so list, far. and and it really simplifies. People often ask me, Jonathan, how should I look at nutrition labels? Two things I'll mention. One. Uh, most sane foods don't actually have nutrition labels on them because, for example, when you buy spinach at the grocery store, if you buy it in bulk, it's you just take it and you put it in a plastic bag. It doesn't actually come in a package. It doesn't even have a nutrition label. And if you get fresh meat from a farmer's market or you get fish from the fish market, it's not going to have a nutrition label on it. So if you're truly eating uh, maximally sane foods, non-starchy vegetables, high-quality protein, whole food natural fats – you may not even see a nutrition label, and that's okay because they're water, fiber, and protein packed. So instead of looking at nutrition labels or worrying about them, just ask yourself, is this food rich in water, fiber, and protein? And if it is, it's very satisfying, unaggressive. It's also high in nutrient quality, and here's why. Nutrient quality, we already talked about. It's nutrients divided by calories. Water has no calories, so the more water in a food, by definition, the higher nutrition to calorie ratio. And the more fiber in a food, we talked about in the last podcast, fiber isn't digested by your body. It's non-caloric. So again, the nutrients to calories ratio is higher if there is more fiber in the food. Finally, we'll talk about this in the next quality, uh, calorie quality factor is protein. Protein is metabolized very inefficiently by our body. So it's less caloric than carbohydrate or fat. So if we have water, no calories, fiber, no calories, and protein, less caloric, that makes the food more nutritious Got because it. there's less calories to divide the nutrients by. Right. Does that make sense? Yep, it does. So now let's, you've explained it. Now that I have broken it down, the uh, let's let's do an experiment, Carrie, because this does really flip some elements of nutrition on its head. Most noteworthy is the discussion around starches, like cereal, bread, or even healthy whole grain starches. Water, fiber, protein. Whole grains are they're dry. Right. No water. They uh, they don't really have much protein in them. We all know that. And fiber. Now, here here's where the, the marketers hang their hat. They say they're great sources of fiber. What, Gary, have you heard that? Yes. What do you think about that? Compared to some other things, they are. Yep, absolutely. Compared to donuts, it's all good. It is all good. But the thing I like to say is comparing whole grains to, to donuts or sugar is a bit like comparing one broken leg or two broken legs to one broken leg. <laughs> Just because it's less bad for you doesn't necessarily make it good. And uh, that's a problem we see a lot in nutrition where people will identify uh, A is bad and B is not as bad, so eat more of B is, is not good logic. We should say, uh, is it good or not? Not, is it less bad than something else? And if it's good, then we want to eat more of it. And certainly, if the choice is between a donut and whole grains, eat whole grains. But if you're simply trying to identify the most nutritious foods in the world, whole grains are not them. Let's do the, the analysis, Carrie. We already talked about they're dry. They're low in fiber. Excuse me, they're low in protein. So what about fiber? Well, again, if we compare whole grains, like if you took it, look at 20 common whole grains, 20 common fruits, and 20 common non-starchy vegetables, average the fiber intake, whole grains have about six grams of fiber and 250 calories, which is much better than donuts, which have one, but is terrible compared to non-starchy vegetables, which have 46. We have really been railroaded by the, the whole grain brigade, haven't we? I, you know, and I, I don't, well, maybe railroaded is not fair. Maybe they really don't, or haven't looked at it how you've presented it. Maybe they really don't understand that it's really not a lot of fiber compared to other things but we really do we all have this notion that whole grain is king and really it's not at all and just to try to empathize with the people who advocate whole grains uh, my my father and sister work in addictions counseling and there is a technique in addictions counseling where if someone is smoking a lot of a very bad drug and they start using a less bad drug, that is progress. But here, and, and I could imagine the logic in traditional nutritional wisdom of the past 40 years being something like, well, instead of eating sugar and white bread, you should eat whole grains because they're better for you. And they are. But just because they're less, so if the message was whole grains, not as bad for you as refined grains is much different than whole grains, 
so good for you. Right. Like fill your plates up with whole grains. In fact, eat so many whole grains, you may not have room for non-starchy vegetables or high quality protein and you definitely should be eating them in place of whole food natural fats. What? Yeah. Like that's that's a totally different message. Yeah, it is. But that's the message we've been told. I would love to see an advertising a advertising campaign that says whole grains not as bad for you as refined grains. Right. And I would I would sign off on that advertising campaign. That's not what we hear. Got it. Got it. Makes sense. So back to our comparison of 250 calories worth of non-starchy vegetables. Again, those have 46 grams of fiber. I'll put this graph up again in the show notes versus whole grains, which have six. Another way to put that in perspective, Carrie, is when we talk about the critical importance of nutrient density is the technical term for it, where it's nutrients divided by calories. Let's say for some arbitrary reason that we wanted to eat 46 grams of fiber. Like in one day, our goal is to eat 46 gram of, grams of fiber. If we did that with non-starchy vegetables, we would only need to consume 250 calories of non-starchy vegetables. However, if our goal was to eat 46 grams of fiber and we wanted to do that by eating whole grains, guess how many calories of whole grains we'd have to eat? And don't look at my notes. I, I, can't, I can't actually, I can see the graph, but I can't read the text from this okay, distance. Okay. Um, so I want to get 46 grams of fiber from whole grains. How many calories do I have to eat? 1,142. Cl Close-ish. 19 or 1,917. Wow. So we hear about the wow. Ad, I know, right? I mean, a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of people can get by very easily on 1,800 calories per day. If you wanted to eat 46 grams of fiber, which is not a huge amount, you would have to eat nearly 2,000 calories worth of whole grains. Holy cow. That's mad. It is mad, and it's, it's sad. I wonder what that looks like in volume. I wonder if you could actually eat that amount. I mean, that's... Wow. Well, the sad, well, and the sad thing, though, Carrie, is that you, going back to um, satiety, the first factor, you could actually relatively easily, because remember, even whole grains, they're dry, they're low in fiber, and they're low in protein, so they're small. Yeah, I, I guess I was thinking, I mean, in terms of in a loaf of bread, which would just be the hardest going thing ever. Can you imagine eating that amount of bread in the in the? Oh, yes, like in one sitting. I yes, mean, that would be wow. Phenomenal. Oh. But if you were going by, for example, uh, I know it's very common, uh, one bowl of cereal usually doesn't fill most people up. I mean, if you're eating cereal for breakfast, it's usually a couple bowls of cereal. And uh, it's, not, it's not too hard for those to add up across three, four meals and to, for us to be taking in 2,000 calories just from starch. It's, it's really not a challenge. That's amazing. It is amazing. It's unfortunate, Carrie, because... Actually, I keep hearing stories like this. Uh, one of my friends, uh, actually a friend of my mother, so kind of my friend, <laughs> an acquaintance, let's say, she recently went uh, to her physician and she has been trying to go sane but hasn't really done it. I mean, it's just kind of dappling with it. Uh, even in doing that, she has seen improvements in her cholesterol, which is an issue she's been struggling with with her physician. And her physician was like, okay, you're doing well, but you need to do better. So the physician hands her some sample boxes of all brand. And she walks out and she sends me an email that says, oh, Jonathan, I'm really excited because I just started experimenting with sane eating and I am doing better, but my doctor says I need to eat more fiber. So he gave me all brand. <laughs> Which, give, but that's what give, everyone well, would do, right, right? But given what you've just told us over the last ten minutes, that's kind of funny, really. When she could, you know, absolutely eat, eat spinach or lettuce or any number of even some fruits and vegetables, and just have a gazillion times more fiber. It's kind of funny a that he gave her all brand. Absolutely, and if she's going to start eating that all brand as an effort to boost her fiber intake, well, she may inadvertently overeat too many calories and now she's overeating and she's going to gain weight which is going to make her sad and have other negative impacts on her health when she could just eat non-starchy vegetables or sane foods and she'll get way more fiber because again they're water fiber and protein rich hey i've just realized that i spent three years at university eating bran flakes for breakfast every day and that was kind of a waste it, I'm kind of mad about that now. <laughs> I mean, because I thought yes. I was eating a ton of fiber. If you would have had an omelet with, you know, a bunch of non-starchy vegetables, because remember too, uh, leafy greens like spinach. When you cook spinach, three cups of spinach turns into nothing when right. you cook it down. So you could easily have an omelet with four cups of spinach in it easily, 
and have a more delicious and a more satisfying uh, breakfast than, than you would with this dry cereal that we think we all need to eat. Wow. I ate a lot of bran flakes. <laughs> I'm kind of bummed about that now. No, it's true. And we even we see in uh, even health food stores, right? We see things like uh, wheat germ or these bran flakes that they sell in bulk, which again, oh my gosh, look at all this great fiber. Uh, again, yes, they have fiber in it. And if you're, if you're going to add, uh, if your choice is between eating rice puffs and bran flakes, bran flakes are better for you, but why not just eat a delicious non-starchy veggie filled omelet? I mean, that's going to have even more fiber and it's way more delicious. I'll tell you why. Why? It needs cooking. It, well, that that is a part of it, but smoothies. I mean, I don't mean we to haven't be talked about smoothies yet. But, yep. but I I get why, especially in the mornings, if busy family, da 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 da, da you know, tip in a box of cereal versus cooking an omelet with a bunch of veggies in. I see the appeal of that, but then I don't think people realize how little fiber they're getting when they pick the Correct. cereal versus you know, and if they knew that really there was no comparison, maybe that would help them to get past the cooking thing. I love that you made that point, Carrie, because I, I definitely don't want this to come off as holier than thou or like, oh, you shouldn't be eating cereal. But what I think is a travesty is when people do do things in an effort to better their health and uh, because they've been given bad information by people who make money off that bad information, they're, they're basically wasting their time. I mean, if you want to eat cereal and you're, you're eating all brand and you're choking it down and it's terrible uh, and you're doing that because you think you're getting a lot of fiber, if you could wake up 10 minutes earlier and just throw some non-starchy vegetables in a pan and make a delicious omelet, you'd be doing even better and you could enjoy it. Yeah. So there's also a bunch of things. I personally, I don't cook in the morning. I do smoothies, all kinds of cool options we can talk about in later podcasts where you just take you know, frozen fruit, potentially even some frozen veggies, throw them in a blender together, put some whey protein in there. It takes about five minutes and you're going to get more fiber and more nutrition in that, you know, glass of a green smoothie than you would in any reasonable amount of whole grain cereals. Sound good? Sounds awesome to me. All right. So I'm a bit of an omelet fanatic though. So you're (laughs) preaching to the choir in the omelet department. But. So, no, it's good. I love omelets too. And there's, there's all kinds of other breakfast options. I mean, another one which is as easy as cereal is taking a, a Greek yogurt and adding potentially some blueberries to it, raspberries, strawberries, and potentially some milled flax seeds or some chia seeds. It's basically like cereal. You're just using the Greek yogurt in place of milk because it has a much higher protein content. Therefore, it's much more sane, has a much lower sugar content, more sane. Put the berries in there put some milled flax seeds in there, and you have uh, basically sane cereal. You're going to get way more fiber. Now you make me want to go eat some of that. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's quite delicious. I, Greek yogurt is second to non-starchy vegetables, probably the second highest consumed food in my diet just because you can do so many things with it. It's, it's very, very versatile. So nutrition quality per calorie, researchers at Colorado State University – did all this math for us and created a, a handy dandy chart, which I'll again provide online, that stack rank foods in terms of nutrition quality per calorie. And as we would expect, non starchy vegetables have far and away highest nutrition per calorie. And remember, non starchy, so not potatoes, not corn. We're talking about uh, green leafy vegetables, uh, peppers, cucumbers, mushrooms, things you put in salads. Second on the list, which might surprise some people, is actually seafood. And seafood is much higher than the next three or the next two, which are lean meats and fruit. So from a nutrition per calorie perspective, non-starchy vegetables is in a league of its own. Then seafood is kind of in a league of its own behind non-starchy vegetables. Then come lean meats and fruits. Most people don't think of seafood as just being this bounty of nutrition, but it really is. If you want to go completely sane, the two most important aspects of doing that are consuming just a huge amount of non-starchy vegetables and also enjoying seafood, not just every day, but potentially multiple times a day. Seafood is fantastic for you. And then we look down that list and whole grains uh, are on the list and they're actually relatively close to fruit because not all fruit 
is created equal. If we looked at things like berries and citrus fruits, they'd be much higher than whole grains, but this is an analysis of common fruits. So it right. includes things like grapes and bananas and apples, which are not very nutrient dense. So water, fiber, and protein. And Carrie, it's also actually kind of fun because when we start doing this nutrition math, if you're a geek like me, you start to, you start to have some fun with it. And you start to say, well, like, let's look at some foods and let's do some of this math. Let's take a serving size and let's look at protein, for example. And let's divide the amount of protein in a serving size by the amount of calories in a serving size. And let's actually see what are good sources of protein. Like we already kind of did this for fiber. Let's do it for protein. Okay. So when we look at grams of protein in a 250 calorie serving, and folks, I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, but this is so important. Again, when you see the serving on the side of a box, take that with a grain of salt because I can say whatever I want is a serving. What we need to do is compare 250 calories of X to 250 calories of Y. Because again, right, a serving of whole wheat flour is in no way, shape, or form the same as a serving of spinach from a per calorie perspective. Right. So looking at grams of protein in 250 calories, what are three things we commonly hear are good sources of protein, carry Nuts, milk, and beans. Right? Milk, we always milk hear for sure. Milk for sure, and then oh, I'm eating some nuts as a snack because they're a great source of protein. So not knocking nuts, not knocking milk, and not knocking beans, but let's just look at them at a protein per calorie perspective. Now, 250 calories of mixed nuts has seven grams of protein in it. To put that in perspective, 250 calories of white bread has eight grams of protein in it. That's wild. And to further put that in perspective, uh, spinach has 33 grams of protein per 250 calories. So let's, let's keep going on the list here, Carrie. So I'm going to go from least to most grams of protein in 250 calorie servings. That, that's, that's, that's amazing that spinach has significantly more protein than nuts. Absolutely. That's a bit mad. Really. Well, and, and, and why, Carrie? The, the nuts, and it doesn't, this doesn't really clear here, folks. This doesn't mean nuts are bad for you. Nuts have a lot of fat in them. Because nuts have a lot of fat in them, they're going to have a higher caloric density than something like spinach. So if you look at 250 calories of nuts, it's much less food, and it's going to have much less nutrition than something like say spinach, but people can't li live on just spinach, so we have to combine foods. But yeah, things like mixed nuts, seven grams of protein per 250 calories, 2% 2 milk, 15 grams of protein, kidney beans, 18. Okay, seven for nuts, 15 for 2% milk, 18 for kidney beans. Here are foods that are better sources of protein than those. Whole eggs, 20 grams, broccoli, 22, soybeans, 25, filet mignon, 25, salmon, 27, a chicken thigh, 31, spinach, the shocker, 33, chicken breast, 34, top sirloin, 34, whey protein powder, 50, cod, 54, egg whites, 56, and tuna, 56. So there's definitely, we oh, it's a good source of protein. Uh, not so much, right? Because if we wanted to eat Let's say we wanted to get the amount of protein from mixed nuts that we would get from 250 calories of tuna, we'd have to eat like thousands of calories worth of mixed nuts, and that's not a good idea. Right, I, and I, I got to tell you that the, 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 the teachings from my youth are hard to get past because I still look at milk and think protein. I just... I. And, and I've known for what, how long have I known you? I don't know, eight months. I, I've known that it's not. I still look at milk and think protein. And I just, you know, it, it's, it's going to take a while for, the, for the, the new message to get across. It, it absolutely will. And the, the good news, though, Carrie, is that um, while it is new, in some ways it's, it's very old. It's not as if this is some... Um, huge technological breakthrough or it's it's some crazy fad like we're just saying divide the amount of protein by the amount of calories and then do the same exercise for other foods and you see what i mean like it's not a theory it's just like let's do math instead of people just throwing out things like milk is a good source of protein well is it mathematically actually no it's not 
But that doesn't mean, for example, dairy is off the table because if you look at non-fat Greek yogurt, that has a huge amount of protein right. per calorie. And just to be very clear, I just said non-fat Greek yogurt. And I mentioned the list of good sources of protein that egg whites were super high up that list, right? Egg whites, 56 grams of protein per 250 calories compared to a whole egg, which has 20. And throughout the Smarter Science of Slim, I say things like non-fat or low-fat Greek yogurt and non-fat or low-fat cottage cheese. This is not because fat is bad for you. Fat is absolutely wonderful for you when it's coming from whole food natural sources. Right now, we're talking about protein. And if your goal is to consume more protein, if, a, if you have a choice between eating full-fat Greek yogurt and eating non-fat Greek yogurt, common sense and math tell us that non-fat Greek yogurt is a better source of protein simply because the ratio of protein to calories is higher. I'm glad you pointed that out because I think on a first pass reading your book or reading about your stuff, people may take away that you're all about low fat, that this is a low fat eating plan and it absolutely is not. When you talk about low fat cottage cheese or, or non-fat Greek yogurt or eating egg whites instead of whole eggs, you're talking about protein content. It's actually on having to do with the fat. That's exactly right, Carrie. And it's just about being, what you'll find is it is easy to eat fat. It's generally not hard for most people to eat fat. We're genetically wired to enjoy fat, much like we enjoy sugar. You should see how fast I can down a pound of butter. <laughs> no, it's, it's very true, I'm right? Teasing. I mean, if what, it, <laughs> you can eat a thousand calories of, of mixed nuts without trying. It's not hard. I've probably done it myself. However, to try to eat a sufficient amount of protein or a sufficient amount of non-starchy vegetables um, to trigger the hormonal reaction that we're after, that's not going to happen accidentally. I must admit, if there's a, a struggle, and I know that from reading your the blog where you have your forums, that one of the, especially for women, for some reason, the the one of the biggest struggles with the the way you eat is the amount of protein that you really need to be consuming on a daily basis to to trigger that hormonal reaction. Yeah, and it's not because protein is some magical substance, but again, remember from the research, we know that satiety, aggression, and nutrition, and as we'll talk about in the next section, efficiency, water, fiber, and protein. And it, it's not as if I work for the protein council and want people to eat more protein. That's just what the research shows, is that the more protein a food has in it, the more it's going to satisfy us, meaning the quicker it's going to fill us up, the longer it's going to keep us full. It's going to trigger uh, dramatically less uh, insulin and glucose to be released into our body compared to a carbohydrate, so it's less aggressive. And from a nutrition perspective, since protein calories are metabolized differently than fat or carbohydrate, they are, generally speaking, going to provide much more nutrition. Well, let's be honest here. You do want people to eat more protein, good sources of protein, but not because of any bad reason. You want them to do it because you want them to reap all the benefits that you've just talked about. You don't want them to eat protein because you're getting rich off of that. Exactly. Or because I just said that at one point in time and now want to be consistent with it. Like the message has always been water, fiber, and protein. And to be clear, it's about eating whole foods such as non-starchy vegetables, high quality sources of protein, and whole food natural fats. And another aspect, because this is going to come up when we talk about this, with is fat good or bad? Fat is a critical component of a sane lifestyle. And in fact, some fats are so high quality that actually want us to go out of our way to eat them. Things like the fats found in seafood. Salmon, if we go back to this list here, salmon is actually quite low on the list of good sources of protein. It only has 27 grams of protein and 250 calories. Compare that to uh, an egg white, which has 56. The reason for that is, is salmon has a lot of fat in it, but it's fantastically healthy for you fat. The fat found in seafood, the fat found in nuts and seeds, amazingly good for you. So I want us to be able to fully enjoy those fats. Put it this way, Carrie, just like we're conscious about what, where we get our carbohydrate, right? We want to get them from certain vegetables and certain fruits, and we're conscious about where we want to get our protein. We want to get it from organic grass-fed meats, seafoods. I also want us to be uh, 
selective about where we get our fats. So it's all about balance. It's so all about balance. If, if you know that you're going to eat that wonderful piece of salmon then and you know you're going to get all those wonderful healthy fats, then maybe you wouldn't choose to add another fat in another way that, that day. Potentially, or at that meal. Or another example is if you're going to eat some uh, bacon or a fatty meat with your breakfast, maybe you have egg whites in your omelet instead of whole eggs. Whereas if you weren't going to have those fatty meats, maybe you enjoy the whole egg. You see what I'm saying? Where you just, you may make some trades, you may make some conscious decisions because at the end of the day, Carrie, we're after maximizing nutrition and not overeating. And well, we have to be conscious to do that. I'm not the only person on the planet that will happily do a trade if it means we get to eat bacon. <laughs> it's true, right? It's just pick where you, just, and again, Carrie, it's not, we're not saying anything crazy here. Just like no one would say, get your protein from pink slime and, and get your vegetables from potatoes. We're just saying there's better sources of protein, there's better sources of carbohydrate, and there's better sources of fat. And let's ensure that we're eating all of those better sources. So we talked about at the beginning, Carrie, that nutrition quality was so important because it redefines what's nutritious, and I think we've covered that pretty well. We also talked about how it enables us to burn fat instead of slowing down our metabolism and burning muscle. Well, why is that, Carrie? Well, when we eat more water, fiber, and protein-packed food, we get more nutrition while avoiding overeating. Why? Because those foods are satisfying. We also avoid overwhelming the body with glucose or the hormone insulin because they're also unaggressive because water, fiber, protein is the common thread that runs through all of them. So if we combine more nutrients with less glucose and less overeating, then we burn body fat without the negative side effects of starvation. Again, we have more nutrition and a surplus of nutrition is the opposite of starvation. Got it. Make sense? Uh, you're going to make me want to go out and eat again. <laughs> so again, the star system that we went through in previous podcasts for satiety and aggression, we can also apply here to nutritious foods. Most nutritious foods in the world, when we look at it from a nutrient density perspective, unequivocally non-starchy vegetables. Second in the list, there's seafood, high quality meats, eggs, egg whites, and select dairy products such as cottage cheese and Greek yogurt, certain fruits such as berries and citrus fruits. Next category down is gonna be legumes, nuts, and seeds. And then we get into the insane choices such as sugar saturated dairy products, starches, sweeteners, things like that. Because again, it's not that I have anything against them personally, they're dry, they're low in fiber, and they're low in protein per calorie. So that's nutrition. What do you think, Carrie? I just noticed that oils is also like has a zero star rating down there. And but I think it's important to point out to people that if you're, you know, using a tablespoon of coconut oil to, to stir fry all those non starchy veggies is fine. Absolutely. It's also important to note that things like oils are very easy for people to sell. And for example, coconut oil is a good example. Everyone hears coconut oil is so good for you. Coconut oil is so good for you. Uh, coconut oil is good for you relative to many other oils. Do you know what's even better for you than coconut oil? Coconuts, right. like the actual whole food. So there's nothing against oils. We've talked about this in previous podcasts, but remember an oil is a whole food with all of the water all of the fiber and all of the protein processed out. Right. So by definition, it's less sane, less nutritious, less satisfying than the whole food equivalent right. is. But it's fine in moderation. It's But clearly, we, we don't want to go out of our way to eat more oil like we do want to go out of our way to eat more non-starchy vegetables. Right. I just don't like want people to, to kind of feel like life is going to become really weird because you can't use oils to saute your veggies in or whatever, you know, if you want to use some butter before you scramble those eggs or make that omelet, then it's all good. It's absolutely all good. And in fact, those eggs and that omelet has so much more nutrition than the starch and sugar equivalents that we're used to eating. Even with the coconut oil in? Even with that coconut oil, you're going to be way, 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 way better off. And you, you use such a small amount that it's just it really, you know, in the scheme of things, it's all good. It is all good. Folks, the common denominator for satiety, for aggression, for nutrition, all the same, water, fiber, and protein. If you stick with those three things, 
you're going to be happier, you're going to be healthier, and you're going to be enjoying all kinds of wonderful foods because frankly, most food, and when I say food, again, I mean things you find in nature are water, fiber, and protein rich. It's these processed food-like junk substances that are the dry, fiber-free, and protein-poor things, and those are the insane foods you want to stay away from. So next week, Carrie, it's all about the fourth and final factor, which is efficiency, Okay. Which is pretty exciting. I like being efficient. Carrie likes being efficient. We'll actually find next week that we want to be inefficient when it comes to metabolizing food because that helps us to avoid uh, storing fat. So we're going to try to be inefficient in addition to being nutritious, unaggressive, and uh, satisfying. Jonathan Baylor, Carrie Brown, we're living the smarter science of Slim. See you next week. Wait, wait, don't stop listening yet. If you like the podcast and if there's other ways we can help you, please join us in the Smarter Science of Slim support group, which is freely available at the Smarter Science of Slim website, smarterscienceofslim.com. There you'll find all kinds of free recipes and success stories and just all kinds of fun stuff, like how to help your kids go sane and just great community content. And just one last thing before you go, if you wouldn't mind heading over to iTunes and up onto Amazon.com and leaving us a review and then going over to Facebook and liking us,